So we're here at the Low Temperature Laboratory on Aalto University's main campus. I'm talking today with Jere Mäkinen, a PhD student in Applied Physics. Uh, great to be here, thanks for showing us around. Yeah, it's nice to see you, Kate. Yeah, nice to yeah. see you, for sure. Uh, we're standing in front of a big blue cylinder. Kind of looks yeah. like a thermos. <laughs> uh, I know there's a lot of equipment here. It spins yeah. from time to time. Tell me what this actually is. Yeah, so this blue thing is, as you mentioned, it's essentially a big thermos. So it's designed to keep everything that is inside cold. So it's uh, it's not at the room temperature. The room temperature doesn't go inside the thermos bottle, but it keeps the thing cold. Unlike the thermos that is designed to keep things hot, but right. this, it works the same way, right? Okay, so it keeps the cold in. Yeah, it keeps the cold in, or the hot out, <laughs> <laughs> whichever yeah. way you think about it. So it gets pretty cold in there. Yeah, indeed. We can actually cool, cool. the coolest part of our system goes to some, something like one ten thousandth of a degree above the absolute zero. And absolute zero is? That's about minus 273.15. Minus, Celsius. minus 273. Yeah, it's well colder than outside, even yeah. during the winters. <laughs> even during the Finnish winters, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and how do you actually get it that cold? Well, that requires a lot of lot of uh, stages. So the easiest thing to understand is that this is a ther thermos again. So we mm -hmm. fill it with liquid helium that cools it down to uh, four degrees of Celsius above the absolute zero. After that, there are a couple of other mechanisms and the final cooling stage is actually a big chunk of copper which oh. is which is uh, cooled down initially at the very high magnetic field which is why we have the paper clip here so ah right the paper clip this is yeah. something that i've noticed before so. <laughs> so, so tell me about this paper clip because it looks a little bit out of place yeah, this is actually one of our secu security measures, so... <laughs> okay, I one know that you have other security yeah, measures. Yeah, cer certainly, but, <laughs> but this, this is, is one, one of them. them. Yeah, so when we are preparing for measurements, we actually cool down the huge chunk of copper in high magnetic fields. And the magnetic fields are so high that this paper clip is actually sucked in into this, this blue dewar here. And when, then we know to be careful around the cryostat when, when there's a very high magnetic field. I mean, it, if it... Uh, if the magnet quenches, which means it, it hit, heats up very fast, it boils a lot of helium, which uh, turns into a gas and then it creates a huge pressure inside this tube bar. So we don't know not to do anything silly when, when this paper clip is close to. So close basically, to this paper clip, this very simple office tool, is a yes. warning that there's huge amount of pressure in there. Yeah, and yeah. You it, know what's going on. No, it feels a magnetic field. Right. So, so yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which can. Uh, be turned into a huge load of energy, which then evaporates this helium that is inside this this blue bucket, right. and that that builds up a huge pressure if it evaporates really fast. Okay, yeah, and that's what we want to avoid. Yeah, that's what you want to avoid. So you use helium, helium yes. three in this. Uh, this oh. bucket is filled with helium four. It's the most helium common. Helium in, in on Earth, it's the more common is isotope, which is used to wapoon balloons and so forth, mm -hmm. first of May balloons. Yeah. And then inside there is a couple of, couple of centiliters of liquid helium-3, which is very rare. It's only actually produced <laughs> in nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's that what we are studying. So on Earth it's very rare, although it's very common in the universe as a whole. It's the second most abundant element in the whole universe, actually. Helium-3. Yes, most of the stars, for instance, contain a lot of, or all the stars contain a lot of helium-3. Mm. It's used as a fuel for nuclear fusion. So when it comes to this lab, what form is this helium-3 in? Uh, it's, most of the time it's, it's gas, but only within this, this particular dewar we can liquefy it. It only liquefies at three uh, Celsius degrees above the absolute zero. So it's already quite hard to liquefy. Yeah. And some tens of liters of gas are then turned into this cup, a few centiliters of liquid, which is then essentially in the middle, middle here, as you see this yellow taping. Mm -hmm. It's sort, sort of in the middle of this yellow taping. And and when it becomes liquid, how much is there actually in there? Not much. So there's maybe a couple of sugar cubes worth of liquid helium inside. 
okay. in total. So yeah, so when you're working with helium-3, you're working with a tiny amount, essentially. Yeah, it's a tiny amount of liquid, it's a right. huge amount of gas, but it's still, as you compress it, it's, mm. it's the same with water vapor. I mean, mm. boiling a liter of water creates a lot of vapor. Right. right. Which you notice when you go to sauna. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you go to it's sauna, sauna yes. indeed. <laughs> <laughs> We're here in the pumping room. Uh, Yara is going to explain to us what this all is. What's, what are we standing in front of? Yeah, so once we are, once the helium-3 is not in, in its liquid state, but rather it's gas, we need much larger space to store it. So we use these old beer cans, essentially. Old that, beer cans? Yeah, or yeah. What, what are kegs, these are called. Right. Which are then connected via tubes to the dewar. So when we evaporate the liquid, we, we store the gas in, in a similar similar gigs as these ones. Yeah, and you're dealing with a lot of gas, actually. Yeah, some hundreds of liters at most. Yeah, so you need but a lot of room. Yes. And a lot of kegs. <laughs> a lot of kegs. <laughs> a lot of kegs. Of course, they had to be emptied first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you, Yere, about the mini hurricanes that happen in here. Oh, yes, yeah. so one of the unique properties of, of helium-3 is that it turns uh, into so-called superfluid, which means that it can flow without friction. And one of the unique properties of superfluids is that if you rotate the bucket of it, like so, mm. uh, instead of a normal, normal bucket of water, for instance, it uh, responds to rotation by creating a multitude of miniature hurricanes or tornadoes that are all identical, unlike water bucket, which creates one, one big whirl in the middle. Yeah. So this is only possible with superfluids, and that's one of the... No, that's, that's the reason why we have built this rotating thermos so you're cooling it down so that you can make it a superfluid. Yes. And with the superfluid, you get mini hurricanes. <laughs> yes, which we can study. Yeah. They have many interesting properties. Yeah. And what kind of things have you been studying with these mini hurricanes? I have been studying, for instance, turbulence. So turbulence is one of the unsolved problems of classical physics. One of the big ones, right? Yeah, one of the big ones. So it's related to, for instance, weather models, so transport of water and oil in pipes, so how much your car uses, or consumes fuel and so forth. So all kinds of really practical everyday... Yeah, so most, most of the energy that humankind consumes is used for to fight turbulence in one way or another. Okay, so most of the energy that humans A, lot, a huge use. chunk of it, yes. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's the most, but it's, it's but a very it's large there, portion, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's what so you've been hoping to study with that. Yeah, with that's, that's one of the things, because once we can create these this, uh, identical mini hurricanes, uh, we can simplify the problem considerably, and we, we are hoping to be able to provide some insight into classical turbulence as well by studying the simpler system.